Well, good morning and welcome to the house of the Lord. I'm so glad to see each of you here this morning. Appreciate your presence. And as our custom, let us bow together for our opening prayer. Most gracious Lord, we humbly come before you today and just thank you for the rain that we had this morning to replenish your earth and your fields. And we just thank you, Lord. I thank you for each soul that's taken time, O oh Lord, to be here this morning and pray your blessings upon us. May, you, may we worship you with our whole hearts. May you bless the music and the word and the prayers and all the giving, all for your glory. Just help us, to, Father, to put away the affairs and cares of the world for a few moments and to truly worship your glorious name. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, please join me with our call to worship. Today it's the beautiful Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Amen. Our first uh, Lenten hymn this morning is entitled, O Love Divine, What Hast Thou Done?
Amen. Amen. Please join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. antiquity, very beautiful hymn, O Sacred Head, Now Wounded. Most gracious Lord, as we have been going through this Lenten season, 
Lord, we have taken time to go into our quiet place, to turn off the TV, to turn off the cell, to turn off the computer. And Lord, just to take a few moments to pray and to commune with you. And Lord, today as we're going through that, may we truly examine ourselves. A time for reflection, a time to, to gather um, my fruits, O Lord, time to understand and prayerfully to be in thy will. So Lord, O oh, help us as we go through this time. Guide us and help us that we may bear the fruit you've called us to bear. In thy holy name we pray. Amen. We're blessed this morning. We have the children's sermon. Mary Lynn. She has her daughter Sarah with her today. We're going to try something a little different today. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to see how this works. Get the little children in here for Children's Church, by golly. All right. How are you this morning, Sarah? Good. Can we go to the Lord in prayer? Yes. I hope that we have a good church today and that God is good and he saved all of our lives. He got nailed in the wall and he got arms and legs and everything. Amen. Amen. She was watching on the show the other day. She saw Jesus for the first time getting nailed to the cross. And she came into the living room and she had tears coming from her eyes. And she was sharing about her experience. So I'm, I'm thankful for the cross and we're thankful for Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, today we're going to talk about sharing. You know, most little kids, well, they don't always like to share. See, as you could tell, she likes the mic already. Sarah, do you like to share? No, sharing is caring, though. Yes, sharing is what? Caring. Sharing is caring. And what do you share? I share some things, but not everything. No. And what do you think Jesus, do you think Jesus would share? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, I'm going to share a little story with you real quick. I'm going to share with you a little story in the Bible about a little boy who had a sack lunch, and he wanted to share it with Jesus. And in the sack, there was, well, this is two pieces of bread, but in the Bible story, it was two loaves of bread. The little boy had two loaves of bread, and he had five, what are those? These are little sardines, but he had five fish. Yes. Nope, nope, nope. You got to wait. Got to wait. See, look how excited she already is. All right. What is sharing? Sharing is what? Caring. Amen. Share everything. Oh, even better. You have to share everything. I like that. We're going to remember that today as we're walking in the Lord. But now you can't share your food because of Corona. Oh, well, we're talking about with Jesus, and the little boy had a sack lunch, amen, and he had two loaves of bread. Let's come back to our seat, and you hold the fish and the bread. He had two loaves of bread, and he had five fish, and do you know what Jesus was able to do with those five fish and two loaves of bread? Well, yes, he did eat it, and do you think he shared? Yes, he was able to, he lifted them up to heaven, lift them up. He lifted him up and he prayed over them and he thanked God the Father for the food that he had. And he was able to break bread with the people who came to hear the good news. And do you know that they fed over 5,000 people? It's a lot of people, isn't it? Yes, but not that good because I didn't actually watch it. You weren't there. You didn't get to be there with Jesus. Do you think one day we're going to be with Jesus and we're going to be eating fish and bread? Yeah, because we will die when we get old, though. We will die when we get old, but where do we go? To heaven and Jesus. Amen. That's the best part of the story, right? Yes. Well, in Acts 20, 35, it tells us that it is ble more blessed to give than to receive. And that's what we are learning at home, sharing our toys, sharing our money, sharing everything that we have, right? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. 
She wants to hold the bag now. Okay. So our memory verse for today is Acts 20, 35. It's more blessed to what? Give, sing to, tend to receive. Okay. Hang on. Wait, 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 wait. No, no. Get out of my bag. Look, I have something in here. But wait, 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 wait. I, o- I only have one. I only have one. I only have one. I was going to give it to Pastor Richard. Can I share with him? I can give it to him? Do you see how hard this is for little people, man? It's like trying to pull it right out of her hand, right? She's thinking about it. But because Jesus lives in your heart and he tells us it's more blessed to give than to receive. Amen. And whenever we share what we have, Jesus can take and make miracles out of it. Amen. Amen. And even though we have this little can of sardines and these two pieces of bread and the one Kool-Aid jammer, God always makes sure that there is more than enough and we have something else that we can share. Amen. Here you go. Here's a sucker. One for you. One for Pastor Richard, and there we are. Amen? You can give Pastor Richard that. So that is our lesson for today. We're trying to change it up. We're trying to make things more sweet for the kiddos at home. We want to invite them to come. Children's Church is going to be starting pretty soon. Little Sarah is super excited. She knows yesterday when we talked about it, it went even better. The first thing out of her mouth was, I share my money. Glory, hallelujah. Yes, she does. She likes to (laughs) buy things for you um, and then claim them as her own. Amen. (laughs) But we are getting there. So we are super thankful. Glory to God. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Acts 20, 35. And Sarah, thank you so much for coming and sharing your time with me. Do you want to close us in prayer? Yes, thank you. What do I do? Ask Jesus to help us to learn to share. Jesus, I hope you learn to share. He will help us learn to share. Jesus, I hope you help us learn to share for because it's able to share, but you can't share your food now because of Corona, but you can share your uh, toys and uh, money and stuff. Yes, Father God, we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Mary. Sir. <laughs> Very good. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. That let's give them thanks for that. that was, <laughs> thank you. So, this morning we're blessed with a special from Elizabeth and Brandon. Of course, it's a very uh, famous uh, hymn, uh, "Amazing Grace," and maybe you know the story behind it. But I thought we'd just remind you uh, a little bit about it. The, uh, the, the tune is historic or uh, from Antiquity, but the words come from John Newton. And John Newton, before he knew the Lord, was a slave trader. He ran a boat. He literally went to the coast of Africa. He would capture people, put them on his boat, take it back, sell those same people. And he did this for many years and bring them back over to his coast and sell these people. But one day as he was sitting upon the waters, and I like he uses the old word that we just sang in the hymn here, uh, vouchsafe. You know, you don't hear that word too often. But he said that God's grace was brought vouchsafe to him. It was God's grace. And that changed his life. And he left being a slave trader, and he went to school. And he became an Anglican priest of the Church of England. And he became then uh, uh, one that preached the word of God and served the Lord. And of course, always looked back on sadness with what he did. But when he wrote this song, Amazing Grace, he really was writing of a life that had been transformed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Brandon, I'm gone too long. I went preaching. Sorry, brother. Anyway.
children's sermon and the special, I got a hard act to follow there, I tell you. Praise God. Well, I pray you have your Bibles with you this morning, and um, our Lenten text for this morning comes from the famous passage of the Gospel of John, chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 13 through 21, but we'll speak of the story here. Of course, it's always hard to preach from a very famous passage, but I pray that God will lead us to his deeper understanding of his word. So this morning, uh, John chapter 3, I'll pick it up at verse 13. Of course, it's the famous uh, story of Nicodemus and Jesus. Nicodemus had came to him at night, and Jesus has these words. So we'll pick it up in 13. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and and men have loved darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, does not not come to the light, lest their deeds should be exposed. But those who do the truth come to the light, that their deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. O Lord, may you open our hearts to your word. Speak to us in the name we pray. Amen. Well, these last several Sundays, we have been looking at and trying to gauge, in a sense, how to bring our lives closer to the Lord. How do we look within ourselves, but be able to come more clearly in that walk with the Lord uh, as we see? And when we think about that, we understand then that the example of Christ is is who we follow. I was reading the story of a mother that was um, making pancakes for her two young children. And uh, as she was making them, now, you know, I have to say I'm more of a waffle guy, but if you want to ever throw that in, but anyway, pancakes are okay. But anyway, butter and syrup, anyway, making you hungry here. But the, the mother was cooking this up one morning, and the two boys were just fighting, you know, because she was making one at a time. And, you know, the, my pancake, no, my pancake. And so she decided that she could have a, a, a teaching moment. And so she looked at her boys and she said this, she's now, look. What if Jesus was sitting here at this table, what would he do? So the one little boy looked at his brother. He said, you be Jesus today. (laughs) All right, I tried it, man. We gave it a shot anyway. They laughed a lot at the first service, but that's the way it goes. (laughs) But you be Jesus today. How can we think upon that? 
Well, part of this you know very well. Nicodemus had done all the right things. He was wanting to be in the kingdom of God. He was wanting to enter in. He, he had done all the right things. He was born a Jew. He had studied the law to become a rabbi. What that means is he spent 40, 50 hours a week uh, over and over again throughout his life studying the Holy Torah or the Old Testament, we think, the word of the Lord. He would look to that. He would spend time in that. He seems to be very much a man of prayer. He seems very much to be sincere. He goes to the synagogue. He goes to the temple. And he had worked his way up the ladder. He was one of the most 70 powerful men of all of Israel. He was on the Sanhedrin. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. So he had checked all the boxes. He had done everything according to what his understanding was to get into heaven, to be with God for eternity. And to him, he had checked all the boxes off and was, again, not in a prideful or boastful way, but this is what he knew. This is how he understood it. But we find that he didn't know what to do with Jesus. He has saw Jesus work miracles. Now, you have to admit, if you would have been standing there and a blind man was at the gate and the blind man, Jesus went over and touched his eyes and the next thing you do, he could see. Well, if you're Nicodemus, that gets your attention. If he happened to be there when Lazarus had been dead for four days, and Jesus said, come forth. And all of a sudden, Lazarus walked out of the grave. Well, a man like Nicodemus, that gets his attention. There is something going on with this Jesus. There is something going on. So we find that Nicodemus, you know, a pious man, an educated man, a faithful man, really, a man of connection, a man of power, a man of wealth. He goes to Jesus at night. He didn't really want anybody to see him. It would be alluded to talk to Jesus. We don't know that. We just allude to that. Maybe not. Maybe that's just when he went. But he went to speak to the Lord. And the Lord really threw him off. Because he's talking to the Lord and what he wants to know is, Lord, okay, what am I missing? What am I missing? I've done all that I know in my culture, in my world, my faith. I've done all that I know. What am I missing? And the Lord, the Lord looks at him and the Lord says it so clearly. He says in verse 3 there, most assuredly, Nicodemus, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, what do you mean, born again? Uh, I, Anton, is the Greek phrase. And it literally can be translated, born again or born from above. But either way, the Lord is trying to have an understanding that there must be a spiritual birth. And that's why he uses the sense, you must be, both most, must be born of both water and the Spirit. And there's a really sense of that. We are born physically, we are born spiritually. There must be this conversion in the heart. There must be this new birth. There must be, as the, the, the biblical uh, doctrine we've heard of that, regeneration. We were born in our sins and our trespasses. And by God's grace, He rejuvenates us. He brings us to life. And that's what Jesus is trying to say. You must have that awakening, if you would, where the light bulb goes on. The heart is transformed. And you are a new creature uh, in Christ. And thus, Nicodemus is, is very confused. He's very having a hard time. And he can't quite understand what Jesus is saying to him. So the Lord keeps going. Not only in the sense, but he makes reference, Nicodemus, the son of man. Now see, that's a coded phrase. If you were Nicodemus and you were a rabbi, you knew immediately that came from the book of Daniel and other books of the Old Testament. And you knew immediately that Jesus was making connotation or reference that he was the Messiah. The whole phrase of using son of man is the phrase to say, I'm the Messiah. You're coming to me at night. You're wanting to know who I am. And I'm saying to you, I am that one. I am the one that was prophesied. I am the one. I am the Messiah. 
here I am. And of course, you know, Nicodemus, that's going to be a lot to get through. And again, you know, when we're spiritually struggling, sometimes even though it's right there in front of us, it's, it's hard uh, to see. So then the Lord goes on, and that's where we pick it up today in verse 13. And he's telling Nicodemus, says it this way, No one has ascended to heaven, but he who has come down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. The Lord is saying to Nicodemus, look, you must be born again. You must understand I am that Messiah. And the reason I can claim for that is I have left heavenly abode and I am able to go back to that heavenly abode. And see, that's important. See, Satan left heaven with the ideal that he could go back. And we find in the book of Isaiah, it's written this way, and he uses the term, O Lucifer, but here it is. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you, are, you who have weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit at the mount of the congregation on the further sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. But yet, you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. So we find Jesus is making a direct connotation to Nicodemus. Nicodemus knows the book of Isaiah by heart. And we find that the Lord is saying, I am able to descend down, ascend from heaven, and I will be able to go back up to heaven. Unlike Satan, Lucifer, he lost that. He is not the Son of Man. He is not the Messiah. He does not have that. But I do. I am. And then we find that he goes to the next one, and this is another passage, verse 14. He says it this way, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the, must the Son of Man be lifted up. And what he's making reference there, which Nicodemus would have known, was, uh, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Numbers 21. Numbers chapter 21. And what happened there was, they were in the area, it was when the Israelites were in the wilderness, and they were getting snake bit. And um, I, don't, I don't know about you, I don't like snakes. Anybody uh, can, can do without snakes. And uh, uh, Friday, Elsa and I were working in the yard, and I mean to tell you this, like three foot grass snake, man, it came after me with a vengeance. But you know, praise the Lord. Uh, I, I know uh, growing up in the country, you know a few tricks. And uh, anyway, I threw a towel over it and was able to take it out to the backfield and uh, let it go. So it's all alive. I didn't kill it. Now, if it had been a copperhead, that's another story. But anyway, uh, but I, I don't really like snakes. Don't care for them. But the Lord's making reference to when Israel was being bit by snakes and they were dying and there was and that. And so what the Lord told Moses was put up a golden, uh, a bronze serpent on a pole. And whenever an Israelite is bitten, they look up and they will be healed. And that's what took place. It's interesting, I, I, I don't know if you've ever read uh, The Seven Pillars by uh, Lawrence of Arabia. Uh, Y'all know the, probably the film version or whatever. But he writes about there in his travels that he was in this area that we're speaking about in Numbers 21, at, at 3,300 years after. And he said to that day, it still was an area that people could not go at night because they'd be bitten by snakes. They were all, he lists all the different snakes, all kinds, and that's still that way today. Isn't that interesting? But what Jesus is saying is, look up, Nicodemus. Look up. And he is understanding that I am the Messiah. I am the Christ. I am the Son of God. Look up and you will be saved. That check mark that you're so hoping for, that one thing that you're missing, it's an understanding to look up and to believe upon me and be saved. Now verse, 14, verse 15 is the formula. It's repeated in verse 16. But look how the Lord says it this way to Nicodemus. He says it so clear that whoever believes in him, and that's the Son of Man, the Messiah, the Christ, Jesus, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have 
eternal life. There it is. There's the formula. It's not about how many times we go to church. It's not about how many times we may read the Bible or we pray or do works and thank the Lord for all of that. But the bottom line is the formula, God's plan of salvation, is to believe upon His Son. And then the Lord adds that great verse that we love so much, verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. There it is. Without, there's no formula without the love of God. For God chose to love us. God chose wherever we are to love us as we are. You don't have to check out so many boxes. You don't have to be this or have to be that. And I'm not even going to begin. I started the list this morning. All the things I know I'm fixing to get in trouble. It's none of that. It is just that you have faith and understand God's love upon you. Amen. That's what it's about. That's why Christ came. That's why Christ died. That's why Christ was resurrected. That's why he sits at the hand of the Father. And he will come again. Because he is the key of that salvation. And God's love. Now we find that we goes on in that. And, and it's remarkable. Just think about God loves you so much that he sent his only. That's, that's important. His only begotten. That's important. He doesn't have another son to give. He didn't have another one to give. That word begotten is so important theologically because it makes an understanding that Christ always was, is, and will be. He wasn't born as a created. We have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They are one, but have been revealed to us in three ways. But God the Father literally gave God the Son because of His love for you and I. That's pretty big love. Pretty amazing love. And then Jesus goes on to kind of add to that. He's like, well, God didn't send me to condemn the world. That wasn't His goal. It wasn't about to have the judgment for condemnation, although He'll mention that. The goal was the world would be saved. And I'm thankful that that word world includes a lot, everybody, amen? I mean, you can't limit world, you know? God has come that the world may be saved, amen? I mean, you don't have to be pretty enough or this or that or whatever that or handsome enough. It's not about that. God so loved the world that whoever. So it's not about that sense. But he does make the understanding. We see that here uh, in verse, uh, uh, starting in verse 18. He says it, And he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And thus there it is. I'm reminded of the Old Testament passage in uh, Ezekiel. And God asks the question, he says it this way, it's quite, do you think I take pleasure in judgment? It's a good question. Of course, the answer would be no. God does not take pleasure in that. If we remember again, go back to the Moabs when they were on that. And remember what God says to them. He says, basically the word is, I cried, we would translate it. But the word there was, I wailed for you. My love is that great. And that's how much God loves us. But the question is, do we love God? Do you remember when you first started dating? Anybody remember? Well, some of you are still dating. But do y'all remember when you first started dating? None of y'all remember? Come on now. You, don't you, you remember when you were young and they, you'd wait for that phone call? Remember in the, our day, Brother Danny, we had to call, right? Right? We didn't have texts or email or whatever. I mean, you had to tick up that phone and give it a call, you know. And, you know, when they would say yes, how happy we'd be. Good, you know, going out. And you remember that feeling you would get in the heart because you knew something was happening. Love was coming. You know, love was happening. And how hard that was in a sense. But on the other hand, how joyous it was. 
And that's all the Lord wants. That we love Him as He loves us. And that seems very fair, right? I got tickled of the story of a young man that was dating and uh, he was just as happy as can be and one night he had went to see his girlfriend and then he came home and the father was talking with him and they were having a little father-son time and the son said, Dad, he said, I think I'm in love. And the father's like, well, why do you think you're in love? He said, well, when I was leaving, I gave my girlfriend a goodbye kiss. And you know, her dog bit me. And I didn't even notice till I got home. I think I'm in love. All right. Amen. I'm in love. That's what it's about. You don't even notice that the dog bit you. You guys, you're so in love with the Lord. And that's how he loves us. There is no better verse in all of scripture. It is the gospel message. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And that's what we've been proclaiming since the Lord Jesus Christ made that statement. And Nicodemus, I'm going to tell you, he would hear, remember? He comes around to help the Lord later. The Lord worked upon him. And that's our prayer today, that we may love him as he has chosen to love us in thy holy name. Will you bow with me in prayer? Dear Lord, we come to you and thank you for such great love you have given to our hearts. You called us out of a world of darkness into your marvelous light. And today we thank you. Each one of us, we thank you in thy name. And the Lord's people prayed together the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. The power. And the glory forever. Amen. Well, the gospel message of the Lord has been proclaimed today. Pray the love of God has touched your hearts. For our last uh, uh, hymn this morning of Lenten hymn, it's a beautiful hymn written by Fanny J. Crosby. If you remember, she was blind and she wrote these beautiful words. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Oh 
so much for being here today. Pray the Lord has blessed you and hope to see you all again next Sunday. Hopefully we'll get used to this time change pretty soon. If you're able, please stand for our closing benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless. Have a wonderful week.